Okay. Well, and I can assure everyone that um, I've crafted the slides on purpose so that if all of a sudden I lost my voice or we lose power and Adele and Caroline, Caroline have to take over, that's mm -hmm. fully possible based on the slides. And you could all um, email me if there were any questions thereafter, or I guess there is the chat function. And I'd be glad to figure out how to, um, if we can capture that, I'd be glad to respond to you. So, and, and I'm the only Rebecca at all, but certainly the only Rebecca Tataro at Florida Gulf Coast University. So feel free to Google me and find the, the email address. Right. Yeah, I can throw your email into the chat at the end so people can, yeah. Um, okay. So I can't right. see anybody, Carolyn, is that? Right, no, that's, um, that's due to the, we're doing it as a webinar instead of as a meeting. Which, oh, okay. And that's why we can see, we can, only at people designated as panelists can be seen. I see. Okay, so there's 20, there's 29 people logged in. Um, now, some of the people were um, like two people per, for an email address, so that's why it's it's not 50. There's 50 okay. people total registered, but some of them are from like one household. Okay. Um, but I would say in about a minute, it's safe to start. That'll mm -hmm. give people like five minutes to five past, it'll be five past then. And people can see and hear us right now? Uh, Yes. And will you remind me um, roughly how long you'd like me to go just so I'm confirmed? <laughs> Can we wait questions? 40, 45 minutes? Is that okay? Oh, plenty. Oh, yeah, and that's if perfect. I, if, yes. If yes. I end early, there's time, more, just more time for questions. Yeah, and I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions. See. I would say, uh, uh, feel free to start anytime you like now. Yes? Okay. Yes. yes. Hey, hello everybody and welcome to the second of our online salons focusing on plague writing and what we in the context of COVID-19 can learn from past pandemics. Before I introduce this evening's guest speaker, I just want to remind everyone about the upcoming Salem Literary Festival, which will be held online between the 10th and 13th of September. The Salem at the name is the festival's presenting sponsor, and while an in-person festival wasn't in the books for us, the lineup of over 40 award-winning and best-selling authors promises to be better than ever, and this year it is completely free. Learn more and register online at salemlitfest.org. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening, Dr. Rebecca Tutaro, Associate Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Florida Gulf Coast University and Professor of Early Modern Literature. Dr. Tutaro obtained her master's degree from Yale University and her PhD from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She is the author of several books on the pre-modern experience of plague and other complex disasters, including Suffering in Paradise, the bubonic plague in English literary studies, the plague epic in early modern English heroic measures, and most recently, meteorology and physiology in early modern culture, earthquakes, human identity, and textual representation. The recipient of numerous awards and a fellow and invited speaker at the Folger Shakespeare Library, Dr. Tutaro is also editor of Culture Inquiries in English Literature, 1400 to 1700. Her talk tonight is titled The Plague in Shakespeare's London and Lessons for Us Now. And among other things, it would explore what, explore what Shakespeare's plays, fake news and pandemics all have in common. Welcome, Rebecca, and thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Adele. Thank you for having me. Um, I was saying to Adele, um, saying to you, we were just talking about the fact that I never, when I started writing books about bubonic plague, I never expected the the importance and the relevance of them to be what they are now. That was not my goal and not even my hope. And 
certainly I'm not, I'm not happy about it. Um, I am, I am happy. Um, I, don't, I don't look happy, right? But I am very glad um, if, if we all can benefit from looking to the past and we can learn a little bit more about ourselves as human beings in pandemic times and ways that we can comfort ourselves and, and others. That's, that's really the, the, the take home message in a way of what you're going to see. Part of the comfort is going to come from the first half or so of my talk tonight where I'm gonna spend time showing you that compared to bubonic plague, COVID-19 is nothing. That's, and that's a, an extreme thing to say. I mean, in the ways that I'll show you, bubonic plague was a far worse disease to suffer from. Um, and, and, I'll, and the image that you're seeing in front of you, this was created in 1625. This illustrates some of that, including the fact that there was a sense that death took over the city. And you can see the mother and child in the lower left-hand corner. They've fled from the city, but they have nowhere to go, and they're sleeping outside. And this was a killer of children as well. So one of the ways that it was quite a horrifying disease. Let me show you some other, some other statistics here, some other facts. There were three different pandemics traveling the globe that were bubonic plague. And there are the dates. Oh, there we go. Um, I'm getting signs that I'm muted, but I guess I'm not. Can you hear me? Okay, sorry. So we're going to be focusing on 1500 to the 1720s, which is when Shakespeare was writing. But this gives you a sense that by the time Shakespeare is writing and Queen Elizabeth is on the throne, they could look back and they knew there had been prior plagues. And they also knew the devastation of those particular plagues of, of bubonic. Let me tell you a little bit about the mortality rates. You can see it here untreated, which means without antibiotics, because this is a bacterial uh, issue. Without antibiotics, 50 to 70%, those are conservative numbers, die once they contract it. This is very different than COVID-19. And you die within three to five days of showing symptoms. Think about the speed of that. So maybe within a week of being exposed, a week and a half of being exposed, um, death. Currently, for, for what it's worth, you can still contract bubonic plague and still die from it. And so even with treatment, 14% of people who contract bubonic plague die from it. That's in the U.S. So we're not talking about Madagascar where they don't have the health care that we have. To make matters worse, and again, um, now COVID-19 is pretty gruesome if you contract it. My cousin was on a ventilator for 15 weeks. Thank goodness, it's a wonder that he survived and got off. It's a brutal experience. Bubonic plague is, is brutal in ways that are, we might describe them as grotesque. Among the symptoms, as, you, as some of you probably know, you get these swellings that can be egg-sized and up to orange size that are pus-filled, and mostly in the groin. And bubo comes from the Latin word, or there's a Latin word for groin because that's where the marker is. And that's why we know when bubonic plague hits, because you see that telltale sign, nothing else looks like bubonic plague. In addition, there's gangrene in all extremities. And I italicized all, so I don't have to name them. And gangrene would be black, which is where you get the black death from. So all of your extremities um, possibly turning black, along with other things like fevers, chill, weakness, abdo abdominal pain, et cetera. So this is, this is a bad disease, um, worse, than, worse than COVID-19 in, in these ways. And let me show you something else. Um, in the period of time that we're looking at, what I'm showing you here are the number of spikes in mortality. So every five, 10 years at minimum, bubonic plague came back and spiked mortality into what Paul Slack, he's a historian, calls crisis mortality, where we know for sure it was plague that was killing noticeable amounts of people. And that's not necessarily half of a town, but maybe 30%, maybe 20%. That's a lot. And I've highlighted for you here in, in the uh, white color, the years what, when Shakespeare was alive, and most of them when he was also writing. 
So he's fully in the middle of generations upon generations of having experienced plague, or at least going back to his grandparents and having stories of this. And it hits, it hits in ways that are disconcerting under Elizabeth's reign because she doesn't have an heir. So under Elizabeth, we get the first nationwide church prayers and orders to stay home and pray in your home. And we get the first quarantine rules and the first widely distributed publication of medicines and some other documents that are some other aids to getting through this thing kind of on your own. And without it, and the, the, part of this is because without an heir, if Elizabeth died, she hadn't named an heir either. So her counselors and she and her counselors made sure that they had some things in place, including quarantine measures to keep the population somewhat in, in place so that she herself would be less susceptible to contracting it. And that's one of the reasons why we also start to get something called the bills of mortality, which is the first ever count of dead people kind of in, in mass, at least in the Western world. It leads to things like population studies. And, and again, Shakespeare's writing in these years, 1563, 64 is when he's born. We know that plague struck Stratford on Avon in extreme form that year specifically, and that some of his neighbors, the, the other mothers who were his mom's um, equals in age, they lost children. So even just literally down the street, a scholar named Park Honan says 300 yards from his door, there were family losses due to bubonic plague. It's also interesting if you know, so plague continued. So just think about COVID-19 coming in all of these years. You know, um, look at James, James the first reign, 1603 to 1611, not a single year with a break. Now, of course, this is a pre-scientific era. They didn't know about bacteria. They didn't know exactly about sanitation. Um, we've, we've progressed. It's not as bad. Um, I'll, I'll just point out a couple of interesting features, or one in particular. If you look at the 1603 overlap dates between Elizabeth and James, Elizabeth dies in 1603, James comes to the throne in 1603, it's a plague year. And also when James dies in 1625 and Charles is coming to the throne, it's a plague year. And so um, in terms of, you know, there, there's plenty more to be done with plague, to, writing about, thinking about plague time leaders and leadership, and especially in times of transition as we right now are having conventions and speeches and an election. Uh, very interesting similarities. So you can see why the, this picture is apt and people experienced plague this way, among ways that they experienced the horror of it. And so um, Thomas Decker, his pamphlet here, he is saying a rod for runaways. Is he's basically saying shame on you Londoners for fleeing to safety when you should stay and take care of each other. It's interesting. So here are some additional historical resemblances. Then like now, there had been a prior experience of pandemic disease, enough that they had writing. They, they might have prepared themselves better. We might have prepared ourselves better. This is a dramatic one, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I think we all could, and we all are as a nation, which is in Shakespeare's time as well, healthcare was at an issue, was, was an issue. And it exposed the gaps in people who had resources and people who didn't. One of the differences, and so by the way, I'll just note, it's interesting that it, in Shakespeare's time, the problem with healthcare was a matter of churches no longer being in charge of caring for the sick. The Reformation closed so many monasteries and convents where the care was being, uh, where care was, where, which had care facilities. And there wasn't by, by this time a replacement. It was pretty fresh. So there was real concern about how in the world do you even manage these sick people? They didn't have hospitals at all. They didn't have plague wards um, or ways to quarantine people except in their own homes. It's also worth mentioning that because bubonic plague struck indiscriminately in an era prior to science, 
the wealthy people couldn't protect themselves any better than the poor. So we don't see the same kind of inequities in healthcare then as now. It's pretty interesting, actually. So in that way, it's, it's, we're, we're worse. We're, I think we might be worse off, relatively speaking. And communication. Shakespeare's time, you have the printing press. It's been compared to the internet, or the internet gets compared to the printing press. It spreads rumors. This is Adele's um, mentioning of fake news. So we get plenty of rumors about what's going to cure plague, what's, what's not, um, where you should be, how you should behave, and also good stuff. And, and this is, the, this is the, the information I guess I find most, most useful. I rarely ever talk about universals. I'm somebody who believes that we're all, um, you know, special enough, I guess, right? Um, that we're all unique enough and each person experiences a historical continuum and, and everything uh, uniquely. But when it comes to pandemic disease, as we're seeing, we really are all in this together. And here are some, some universals. We do know, now they didn't know this, but we do know that then is now, what causes this thing is a combination of human travel and also the animal host vector being killed off. So bubonic plague, the host was the flea that then was in the rat. And when the rats started to die of plague, when there were not enough rats left, the fleas were jumping to humans to feed on humans. And so this is a different situation um, now about pushing into places where there are exotic animals, but that's how it's, it's related. The host vector being killed off and then humans in, in travel. The other thing that's really interesting is, and why, why in the world would I write four books plus one that's also somewhat about plague, you know, essentially four or five books on plague. There are so many more that could be written and you all know it and you all can write the ones on COVID-19 because it impacts all areas of life, right? I mean, which area isn't touched? I want to find, let me know if you find one. I'd like to just go there. <laughs> um, all areas. So there's so much that can be covered. And this is how we connect with others back then, like uh, through our readings and with others around the globe, everyone on the planet right now is experiencing this. And everyone on the planet and throughout history, just pick up any of the pieces of, of material about pandemic disease, any time in history, and all of the emotions are on the table. Grief, sorrow, anger, depression, loneliness, anxiety, horror, relief, hope, courage. And please let's have a little more hope and courage, right? But they're all here. And, and those of us who are a little bit older, at least, thank goodness, we kind of know life is going to deliver all of them to us anyway. So we've at least had some practice by now. But oh my goodness. And here's the last piece. I, I really, um, in terms of universals, this is 100% true. The certain needs, no matter who you are, no matter where you are, is connection, charity, and caregiving. And that's, that's so simple and so it, it would be kind of hyperbolically sweet if it weren't just true. And I'm glad for that, actually, because <laughs> I think that makes us human. So I'm going to share with you now some writing from that time, from Shakespeare's time. I'm going to start not with Shakespeare. And, and you will see some of these universals expressed in first poetry. So you'll notice the year 1603, this is written by Ben Johnson. He's the person who put Shakespeare's plays together into the first folio, by the way. His son died a plague. That's not something we hear much about people uh, and, and their children. So his, his only son actually, or sorry, his first son. He says, farewell thou my child, or farewell thou child of my right hand and joy. My sin was too much hope of thee, loved boy. Seven years wert thou, thou wert lent to me, and I be pay exacted by thy fate on the just day. Oh, I could lose all father now, for why will man lament the state he should envy? Rest in soft peace and asked 
say, here doth lie Ben Jonson, his best piece of poetry, for whose sake henceforth all his vows be such as what he loves may never like too much. We are blessed, lucky, whatever you want to call it, that children are more or less spared with COVID-19. There's plenty of horror to go around, but at least it's not there. Um, you may know this, this piece. You may not know, you may not recognize the title here, Devotions Upon Emergence Occasions. John Donne, Dean of St. Paul's in London, also a writer of some pretty dirty poetry that I am not sharing tonight. <laughs> um, he did both, wrote the poetry first and then became Dean of St. Paul's. In 1624, he was Dean of St. Paul's and contracted an illness that they thought was maybe contagious. It, we know it was not a plague year, but they didn't know that. So he was in quarantine when he wrote Devotions Upon Emergent Occasions. And now you will recognize it. Meditation 17 of that devotions is for whom the bell tolls. The bell doth toll for him that thinks it doth. Who can remove his or her attention from that bell which is passing a piece of himself out of this world? And I'll pause here to say, you know, this is when we see the, the stories about who has died from COVID-19. How can we not pass, uh, how can we not pause for that bell which is passing a piece of himself out of this world. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory were, as well as if a manner of thy friends or thine own were. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. And now you know a little more about the context of this and it's still so relevant, right? I mean, we could put this right into the conversations people are having about what our future looks like and how we take care of each other. And this is the last one, and I know you won't know this guy. So this is a, a work called Meditations in My Confinement. And what it is is someone writing a very rare piece for this time. It's the equivalent of almost a memoir, but it's, it's more crafted than that. This is written by, I'd call him a poet, but I'll call him a poet, Thomas Clark. It's just that this is the only piece of writing that survived from him. And we don't know anything else about him except for this piece. What he tells us in his poem is that he self-quarantined because his children were infected. And we know at least one or two of them died. There's a reference to his losing his children. And I'm sharing this now, it's actually gonna be, it's actually an upward, uplifting kind of piece because what he writes about, he spends at least half of his time writing about what he confesses is, the second line, much privilege I had in my distress. I was not padlocked in, nor by a guard of watchmen by constraint of freedom barred, but wholly left unto my own discretion. Which kindness showed in me too much impression, this I acknowledge was my neighbor's love. And what, what that means is what he's saying is that because he's self-confined, he told his neighbors, hey, we have this, we're not gonna go out they helped him out. They could have told the authorities, they could have had an official quarantine, they could have had his door marked, they could have had a guard there to make sure that if any of the family members left, there was a penalty. And nobody did that. People trusted that he would be mindful of their needs and they of his. And apparently they brought him some food and they would, they would help him out. And so this is a lovely, you know, this is what I'm talking about, charity, community. These are some, we see this reflected too in these past works. I think it's so easy to think this is a time of chaos and horror and you better barricade yourself in your home and stockpile stuff and make sure you have all the toilet paper you need and don't give it to anybody because then you're gonna be a sucker. And that's just, 
that's not how it works, you know. I mean, we can we can learn from somebody like Thomas Clark, and we can learn to avoid what Shakespeare shows us, which is this kind of tragic vitriol, I'll say. And I won't even read these words out loud. One of the reasons that I mean this uh, this curse of Mercutio seems too close for me to read it out loud and and put word put in my mouth the curse that it is. You can read it here. We only need get to these kinds of um, extremes of tragedy if we shut each other out. We all know that the real tragedy in Romeo and Juliet was the parents' decision not to let them be together. And this leads to Mercutio wishing that both families would have this horror visited upon them. And indeed they do, right? Um, so it just doesn't, and, and this is a, a tragedy. Shakespeare's not recommending it. He's saying quite the opposite. So. I'm going to actually wrap up, and I don't know now, I stuck my watch somewhere, here we go. I'm gonna wrap it up, Ooh, close to decent time, I suppose, um, with, and leave you, with, leave you with Thomas Clark, because it's so much happier, and, and with the reminder that Shakespeare wrote Romeo and Juliet a couple of years after major visitation of plague, but what he followed Romeo and Juliet and all of the tragedies with some of you know, are the romances. And the romances are about kindness. And they're about resurrection, reconnection, and, and health, and things actually winding up better than they could have, better than people could have hoped. And so that's where Shakespeare kind of leaves us in the story. And that's where I'll leave you all um, now and take your questions. Thank you so much for that, Rebecca. Um, questions I imagine are being submitted by the chat. Um, but before, I don't think I, there are any quite yet, but um, I have a couple of questions for you, if you don't mind. Um, so first of all, I just wanted to ask you whether, I mean, people in this, in this period were very superstitious uh, and they saw, um, the plague as a, a sign of God's displeasure, right? Um, that somehow, you know, their, their sinfulness had led to them being punished. And I was just wondering, was there, was there a stigma attached to, to, to catching the plague? I mean, were, were you thought to be particularly wicked or something if you were unfortunate enough to contract it? Yeah, I love that question. <laughs> um, because here's the thing, you know, we, they were superstitious, but they were better observers of reality in some ways than we are now. They knew their bodies better and they, they got news from other people. And so get this, they could tell everyone was getting hit equally by this. So versus something like syphilis, where, okay, you know, that's the behavior that gets you and probably it's sin sinful. This is a disease where they did not finger point by this, by Shakespeare's time. And even, so in the, in the, the advertisement for this talk tonight, I mentioned Pope Clement VI, as early as the 14th century with the first outbreak of bubonic plague in, in Europe, um, or I should say, I suppose the second pandemic, but in any case, Pope Clement had issued a statement forbidding Christians to harm Jews or blame them for the plague because he too and others who were paying attention could see that it was hitting Jews equal to Christians, equal to children, equal to everybody, the wealthy and the poor. So you'd think that they would have had a field day blaming each other, but in fact, in this case, they didn't. And so what's, if you, if, if it's okay, I'll, I'll tell you the other interesting um, Peace is so then the question is well but clearly wouldn't god be upset if he's sending isn't he sending this plague so then if he who's he how's why like how why is god doing it and they had to do this mental gymnastics because they had to agree well it's being sent to all of us in england so what's that about and the church really could really worked hard so some of the church prayers and things what they say is he's sending us fatherly correction he loves us. It's a warning that we should stay on track. What a good dad. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you so much. Um, I see Shelby has a question. Uh, I'm just going to read it out to you if that's okay. Did any of the suggested remedies or preventive actions come close to recognizing what was causing the plague? Kind of a medical question. Are you okay to take that? Yeah, I love that. I've never, I have, I guess I haven't thought about it exactly in those terms, but they, they could tell that there, there, there seemed, it seemed that there was human to human transmission. Um, and that's why, and it, so, so, so they did not practice to my knowledge. There's nothing outright medically sound that they practiced that we would still recommend. It's more about quarantine, and, and, and social, you know, so other kinds of social distance that they did practice. So um, we do still, it's an interesting thing. They had, so by the way, the plague doctor beak mask thing. That, I was just gonna like, ask you about that actually. Yeah. They, so they knew to wear a mask. Well, so this was something they actually didn't do. I mean, I'm, I'm oh. not, it would be really cool if they did and everybody's but this is a later phenomenon that was a rarity for people who had a lot of money but what it connects to and what they did believe is that they did believe that think about it they believe you can only smell one thing at a time and they did think that if you smelled something it could go into you and infect you so that's why like the nosegay or smelling something sweet or something pungent to replace the potential plague vapors that is something they practiced. So what did they fill the beaks with, by the way? Because I know it's various kind of herbs, yep. I think of flowers. Yeah, and I think Jeez. rosemary and some other things, but it really mm. is mostly on the continent and very rare and more in the 17th, late 17th century. And I, I believe I read somewhere, but correct me if I'm wrong, but another reason why they, they, they stuffed the beak with herbs was because of the stench of rotting corpses. There was, it was well, as much I, to block out the, the, the smell. Yeah, and it's because they would have thought it would go together. I mean, you know, you smell death and you take it inside yourself. So it's, it's, it wasn't just about the smell. It was about what the smell could do to you. Mm -hmm. And besides, I mean, I, I haven't, it would be interesting for me to look back and see if there's also something about the fear of the smell. Because there was a sense that if your emotions were just were really raw um, and you were really distressed that that could make you more susceptible to it too kind of the way i'm thinking about stress and anxiety and depression are that's so interesting um so alan has a question for you um are you planning to write a book on the coronavirus outbreak yourself soon when this is over will you wait to allow some time to pass to gain some perspective um the way some writers do uh, do you think that we're close yet to really understanding it that's such a great question. I don't think that book is mine to write um, and, and only because I'm such a, exactly. I would have to figure out how to live a hundred years longer first. So I could look back and, but the other thing is I think I mean, with COVID-19, everybody's going to already be writing about it. So I, yeah, so I love your question. Thank you. Because I do think, you know, let's wait, let's see who writes about it 200 years from now. We just won't get to read it. It'll be fascinating because then they can kind of distill some of this, distill the. But I will, I'll, I'll be thinking about another book. I was suggesting to Adele and what I mentioned at the beginning of our talk here is something about plague, pandemic hope and leadership. That's a book to be written. Those are both important and gosh, hope can be, both can be so abused. Um, on the subject of leadership, I'm quite conscious that the, the questions are now flooding in, but um, I mean, was Elizabeth the first regarded as a better uh, leader during plague times than, than James the first, who was so unpopular? Well, there's what did they do differently? Yeah, you know what, and I'm definitely someone who likes to see, unfortunately, to my, my own disadvantage, I can find the good in any person who's a real jerk, even. <laughs> But James was really apparently a real number. Um, and so definitely one of the things that, so it's interesting, what we know when it comes to plague with James is that he came to the throne when plague was in London, so he couldn't even be coronated on time. And he was an MIA kind of a, a leader for quite a long time. The slide that I have the dates, it was 1603, which is when he comes to the throne to 1611, those were plague years. So he wasn't around in London a lot. At the same time, he actually increased the penalties and fines for people who broke quarantine. 
So we, so that's just one of the many ways that he increased the penalties and fines on a lot of people, um, or a lot of pop groups of uh, groups of pop people. And so he was not. I mean, he didn't seem like a warm, friendly guy to begin with, and then did this. Now, having said that, it does appear that under Elizabeth and James, both. We don't have any records in courts of people being prosecuted or actually um, otherwise marked if they break quarantine. So it looks like those were laws just in on paper and for threat value. But right, he was not. Um, it seems like there wasn't much reason to like him. I mean, he 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 like he did have the King's Men. He elevated Shakespeare's group. So there's that. If you're a diehard Shakespearean, you like James because he gave him a, a Shakespeare a better title. Thank you. Um, one of the questions actually uh, that's coming up is what was the penalty for those who broke quarantine, but you kind of answered that. Um, well, actually, and I'll just mention though, um, one of the, and, and it, it's, it's striking, but it was almost never enforced, like I said, is that they were treat, you could be treated as a felon or marked as a felon. And so some of you know what marking as a felon means in the time. It means you could have a chink, a chip, a chink taken out of your ear. I think even a nose sometimes, but definitely the ear. Um, a couple of questions um, about witchcraft, actually. Uh, and was there any a perceived link between the plague and the witchcraft hysteria in Europe in the 17th century? It's a really good question, actually. Yeah, it is. And that's something, I mean, if I were to answer for, for Europe, I, I would be harder pressed to make sure I was confident about it. Um, in, in England, we really don't see a link. And I, and I do, and I, and I could probably say for Europe in general, that for the same reason that people didn't say, oh, it must be the Jews, it must be the, the, well, the, the poor, it must be um, whoever is the sinner. They didn't tie it to, to individual behaviors. Um, so a witch wouldn't have been able to affect the population the way plague did. So it's rather actually a stunning, maybe, and this is, maybe this is something else that makes it relevant, so relevant now, is that perhaps pandemics cut through a lot of BS. I mean, in a way, they affect so many people that you have to grapple with, you, you know, you have to look for facts. You have to work with the facts that aren't just based on name calling and presumptions and, or yeah, and assumptions and stereotypes. I completely agree with you. Um, on the subject um, of scapegoating, uh, were foreigners associated uh, with the plague? Uh, I mean, what was the source of origin, the supposed source of origin? And uh, Sven is asking, did the plague spread to the Middle East and Asia? Right. So, so see, you guys are so smart. Because, <laughs> oh, so, okay, so the, the first question um, is super interesting. And, and this is another way where people in England were um, kind of better behaved than we are right now. Um, they did not fear others or fear foreigners during plague time. There was a, there was a strange way in which they said, well, okay, so God's giving this plague to England, to us for fatherly correction. But they did watch the numbers of plague dead in different parishes and different areas of London uh, and, and in the country. And so if someone was living more in the country or more in the north of England, we know they would um, not be hospitable to Londoners trying to escape the plague. So it's not, not the extent of um, what's mine is mine that we're, I think that we kind of see now. But they, but they were able to identify that there were areas that were more effective than others and those people weren't welcome. And then when it comes to that great question about Asia and the Middle East, we know now it originated from Asia and the Middle East. Now, I, I'm not trying to um, start something by blaming you know, the next guy, but um, we can see that, particularly with the Black Death, that it, it traveled kind of across continents and with ships eventually reaching England. And, and even people in England in the 14th century had word from messengers that it was moving across Europe. And some of those people had been in Asia and the Middle East and had seen it there as well. So they could tell it was moving in that direction. 
So in many ways, it, it, it's a uh, kind of, um, consequence of globalization, burgeoning globalization in this period. Um, very, very interesting that the English could use the plague as a kind of to reinforce the, the idea that they were, you know, formed a nation of the elect. Um, and speak, speaking of the elect, I mean, um, what about the Puritans in New England? Did they manage to escape the plague? This is um, being one of the questions um, gosh. Oh, from you an know, attendee. And how did they do that? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> do you know what? No one has ever asked me. And, and this is the problem with our little, you know, like, I study this. I study England, you know. I mean, oh, my goodness. So somebody look at that. Now, I do know that Cotton Mather was a on the forefront of looking at things like smallpox. And they, they were aware of contagious disease and of course as we know that there were settlers who I guess apparently you know who were trying to give native um, indigenous peoples diseases that they had taken and we know that that happened um, but I don't believe but I, I, I'm not aware of bubonic plague coming to the to to um, colonial America or early the early Americas and boy I better I better look I gotta look into that now and South America too huh yeah. Good one. Okay, one more question, or a couple more questions, if that's okay with you. Um, how did the recurrence of plague affect art and plays in the time? Did people want comedy to help them forget what was going on, or something somber to match the mood? The question from Jen. Yeah, great question. So you already you already know the answer, which is comedies, please. <laughs> Um, which is what we, you know, I mean, not many of us really want to watch all, only documentaries about pandemic disease. Some people do. Um, the other thing, though, is that, so here's a super interesting, right, is theaters closed. So you, that's why we don't have, um, so they could not go to plays when plague was in town. And Shakespeare was furiously writing during that time. So we do have an outpouring of writing, perhaps while people are, are stuck in quarantine. Um, John Milton's Paradise Lost, he was writing when he was outside of London during plague years, if you look at that. Margaret Cavendish, there are a bunch, um, um, gosh, is it um, Sir Isaac Newton? Some of the great discoveries were made when people were forced to stay by themselves alone. Um, so by the way, go out. This is your calling, everybody. So what's your great discovery? <laughs> you know, you're stuck in quarantine. You might as well be, use your genius skills to come up with the next theory of whatever it is. Um, but so, but art, I, I mean, don't you find art and music becomes more important? It's how in the world we show that we're still human in a way that we can tolerate, I think. Um, I'm reminded of the, they were reporting out of Italy when COVID-19 hit Italy so badly first about, remember the people, the musicians coming out on their balconies and playing concerts together. So let's do that. Somebody break out your tuba. Um, do you know what Shakespeare in uh, particular did when the playhouses were closed? I mean, how did he make use of his time? So, I mean, I'm sure he did a bunch of things other than write. We, we got to figure, but but we do know we would not have the rape of Lucrece. We would not have Venus and Adonis. We might not have the sonnets. I mean, so his poetry comes out of the time of theaters closed. We probably, many scholars are willing to conjecture that we would not have as many of those great, the great tragedies. If you look at the timeline, they all occur after theaters have been shut. So Hamlet, Othello, Macbeth, all of them. And I wouldn't say they're about plague, but you could call them plague time plays. And so kind of to that question, those aren't comedies, that's for sure, but they don't deal directly with plague they sure do end up with a pile of bodies on the stage at the end. So they sure are cathartic. And I can recommend, I, I'm shocked to say it in a way, but if you want to feel better right now, among the many things you can do, like call your mother, call your grandmother, um, really donate to good charities. But you could also read Stephen King's The Stand. It's really long and we've got plenty of time. <laughs> but it will make you feel a lot better because we are not living through that either. Um, and so there is something cathartic about taking it to such an extreme, like let your mind that's going to brainstorm all the worst case scenarios go all the distance and then see you can still survive. I'd rather just think about bunnies and cat and kitties and stuff, but some of you might like Stephen King right now. 
Um, so if we can just stay on the subject of Shakespeare for a second, because um, you mentioned plays like Hamlet and King Lear. Uh, are there references in these plays, like overt references to the plague? I know that in King Lear, there's a lot of references to sores and boils and mm. that kind of nasty stuff. Do you know what? So it's interesting. There, there are a bunch, 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 bunch of passing references, or at least plague language. I don't think most of them constitute a direct reference. Mm. We do the we get one clear reference to plague in Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet because the letter that is supposed to be delivered to Romeo to let him know that Juliet's not really dead can't be delivered because plague is in the location where the, the priest or the um, friar who's delivering the letter is put into quarantine. He's not allowed to pass and deliver the letter. That's the only place that in Shakespeare it occurs in a, an overt, clearly bubonic plague fashion. And there are some other plays like Ben Johnson, right, who lost his son to plague, writes a comedy about it. But, you know, I guess I think right now in COVID-19, isn't it already always on our minds? And so aren't we always, you know, like being washed over by whatever the reference is to health or well-being or illness or death? It's, it's always touched by that. And I think that's partly what was going on. And it, we don't necessarily, we don't want to spend all of our time talking about it and neither, neither did they. Yeah. I suppose it was never really Shakespeare's style to refer to things, you know, overtly. I mean, his plays are kind of surprisingly free of topical references. Uh, he's more subtle than that, I, I suppose. Yeah. Um, this is a question from Lish. So if the Great Fire of London, so that was 1666, eliminated the plague with finality, um, is it true that in prior years it was not eliminated with certainty? Well, so right, and another great question, oh my gosh. Um, so, um, um, they didn't know it was eliminated in finality in 1666. Mm -hmm. so, so for sure, not before that did they think. And here's an interesting thing. So, you know, Journal of the Plague Year written by Daniel Defoe in 1722. So fast forward to 1722, two years after the plague of Marseille in 1720, because it's still on the continent. Daniel Defoe writes Journal of the Plague Year in part to say to England, look folks, France just got walloped. We better get our acts together here and come up with better systems for charity and how we care for each other. That's part of the reason why he wrote that. So they didn't know it was the end and it was definitive in England, we know that, but we know that. Isn't it so ironic though that it was, I mean, basically the year that you shared the mark of the beast, I think it was 1666. So was it the devil who kind of got rid of the plague? The plague was read as a message of God's particular interest in the nation. Very paradoxical. Yeah. Well, and so that's the thing, right? We do, we also know for sure it was the fire of 1666 that killed, that, that did away with the rat habitat. The thatched roofs, how, roofed houses were rat habitat. And it's kind of as simple as that. It was an architectural thing. It wasn't, certainly wasn't a, a leader coming along um, or Satan. Um, okay, I think we're out of questions now, and unless anybody has one more they want to add to the list. I'm just um, scrolling through to see if I've missed any. Okay, well, maybe um, on that note, we'll, we'll wrap up. And this is um, anything else you well, want to add, Rebecca? No, I'll just go, I'll just end like here. Right? Um, and thank you, just by showing up here, this is, this is as good as it gets for the way humans take care of each other. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. We know it now, so thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you everybody for attending. Take care. Uh, stay in touch. I will. Bye-bye. <laughs>